Hello everyone, and welcome back to the third and final video in making a Mandelbrot viewer using WebGL. In the last, in the first video in the series, we just pretty much initialized a full screen WebGL canvas um, and drew a blank surface to it. In the second video, we drew where we created a vertex shader and a fragment shader capable of doing all of the work for rendering one of these in a fragment shader. In this final video, we're just going to add a little bit of polish. So we're going to add the ability to zoom in and out. We're also going to add the ability to uh, kind of pan around by clicking and dragging the mouse. The first thing I do want to get into though is I want to keep a frame rate up here at the top. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to keep track of um, frame times in here. So let's see. And I don't want to update these all the time. So I'm also going to keep a frames array Yes, okay. Great. So I'm also going to keep frames in here. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. And at the beginning of our loop, so FPS information, and then draw will go after we handle FPS information. All right. Ba -ba -ba. Last frame time equals performance dot now. This frame time equals performance dot now. I suppose I should say last frame time equals this frame time. No, 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 no. This frame time equals performance dot now. DT equals this frame time minus last frame time. Last frame time equals this frame time. Frames dot push DT if last. Do, 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 last print time equals performance dot now. Uh, if our last print time plus 750 milliseconds seems about right is less than this frame time, what I want to do, last print time equals this frame time document dot title equals 1000 divided by the average. Zero i is smaller than frames d frames dot length i plus plus average plus equals frames i average divided by equals frames dot length divi divided by average plus fps and then finally frames equals frames dot slice zero and let's keep the last 250 frames so if I were to refresh that now yep so now we have a frame rate counter up there great um, the second piece that I want to add to this is now I want to add zooming capabilities so let's write something kinda like we did with on resize window except for let's do function on zoom console.log and this one I'm actually going to pass in a parameter this is going to be a mouse event parameter um, add event I want to add this one to the window as well this is going to be a mouse wheel I believe so on wheel and then on zoom great so you can see now when I move the mouse event, I just zoomed out and then zoomed in with the mouse wheel. The out one, all these is going to be a whole bunch of stuff. We are going to have an X and a Y, which could be helpful if we wanted to uh, zoom towards the mouse. That proved to be eh, a little bit more math than I want to get into right now. But we do have this delta Y, which is going to be positive for zooming out and negative for zooming in. So we're going to be using that. So in here, what I want to look at is I want to see what the distance on the imaginary axis is. So um, imaginary range equals max i minus min i. And you can see we're writing this inside of our run demo function. The reason for that is I want to capture these values by closure. Um, and I want to be able to use them. So if our delta y was less than 0, this means that we are zooming in. So I want our new range 
to equal the old range times 0 0.95. Uh, and otherwise, I want to make it 5% bigger. Great. So now what I'm going to do is our delta distance is going to be our new range minus imaginary range. I want to split that delta between moving the current minimum and then also um, expanding the current maximum. So our minimum is going to change min i plus equals delta divided by 2 and then max i equals min i plus new range. So if I do that that does not give the desired effect. What am I doing wrong? So when I zoom in min i plus equals delta divided by 2. I thought for sure the new range minus the old range. So what is delta going to be? Our range is doing that. min i new range minus equals? Is it minus equals? Am I moving in the wrong direction? Okay, yep, it was because I was moving in the wrong direction. I wanted a minus equals. Alright, so now you can see we're zooming towards the center on the imaginary axis, but the real axis isn't changing at all. Now the real axis is going to be significantly harder to change, and the reason for that is we need to maintain the aspect ratio. Um, and so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to just call the on resize window because the aspect ratio is going to be changing in this on resize window. So if I take the imaginary axis to be independent and our real axis to be dependent, um, then that means every time I resize, I need to be recomputing where the real bounds are. Um, so let's see. How do I want to split this up? <laughs> Okay. Var old real range equals max r minus minus min r. New real range equals. So what I want to do is I want to find the new value for max r. So you know what? Maybe I can just update it right now. Maximum r should be minimum i minus or the range of the imaginary numbers times canvas height width plus min r. Cool. So this is our proposed new r, so new real range equals max r minus min r. Great. So now I want to split the difference of the adjustment between the top and the bottom, so I'm going to say min r minus equals new real range minus old real range divided by 2 and then our I'm gonna just reapply this formula again um, yeah I'll just reapply the entire formula again to guarantee just in case I got my math wrong cool yep so we're successfully zooming towards the middle uh, also you'll notice that when I start it the first time it looks like this and then when I click it suddenly bumps and it adjusts which isn't good so the reason for that is we're calling this on resize window very first thing and I don't want to do that until I am drawing so I'm going to call this on resize window after we have set the important thing is just after these variables are set because these are going to be set with the incorrect aspect ratio so I'm going to set that right here um, event listeners. I'm gonna go down there. Great. So if I do that, yes. Now it starts right there, which is awesome. Um, let's see. And I th I feel like I'm doing something a little bit wrong because that's a little bit more stretched out than I would like it to be. So maybe I'm making a similar mistake where I missed up the plus and the minus. No, that wasn't it. Um. Maybe I don't want the units to be completely like one-to-one. -one. Maybe one unit in real. I don't want to be one unit in imaginary. So let's think. If the negative two and two is working for roughly... What is the aspect ratio right here? So we have...
canvas.width over canvas.height uh, 1.4, so why don't we try multiplying by 1.4 mm -hmm. times 1.4 maybe this is some golden ratio alright, yeah, so that looks a lot more Mandelbrot-y so I'm just going to keep that in there Great, so I know that was a lot of hand-waving, but um, essentially what I'm doing right here is every time I zoom, I'm adjusting, I'm zooming in towards the center, so I'm looking at what the old range of the imaginary numbers was, what the distance between the maximum and minimum is. I'm adjusting that by 5%, either in or out. I'm looking at the change between the old range and the new range, and I'm applying half of it to bringing the minimum I value closer to the maximum I value, and then half of it bringing maximum I value in towards the minimum I value. The resize window function I now just also adjusted, so this is all the old code, and the new code that I added does something similar for the real range, except for every time... Um, so every time the imaginary range is changed, the real range is going to be changed to try to keep up with it, to try to maintain an aspect ratio such that the real numbers are always going to be 1.4 times as uh, use, like 1.4 times as long on, in screen space as the imaginary numbers. So now if I resize this, what should happen is not stretching. It shouldn't be stretching. Why is it stretching? That's not right at all. Did I mess that up somehow? No, that's not the code that was messed up. Okay, apparently I messed something up. Maybe this is supposed to be... Um, canvas width over canvas height. I, I don't think so, but it's possible. Okay, yeah, apparently that's what it was. Is I needed to get canvas width and height um, mixed up. So... In that case, maybe we should be dividing so we don't constrict it. Okay. Yeah, okay, so apparently I made a goof, and that was what the goof was. Alright, so now we can adjust the viewing size and the aspect ratio, and we still get the same kind of shape. Perfect. Much better. Sorry about that. Um, hopefully you weren't paying too close attention when I made that mistake, right? Great! So that is one of the two big things that I wanted to cover in this video. The second one is hopefully going to be pretty quick. And that is for the mouse drag. So let's make another function. This one is going to be on mouse move. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, and then I'm going to add that event as well. So add event, window, mouse move, on mouse move. Okay. Console log E. So one of the things that's going to be useful, you can see we have a jillion mouse events. Right now I'm not holding the mouse. I click and I drag, and we still get a jillion mouse events. Um, one thing that's going to be useful for us is we have this e.buttons that we're going to be able to use. So when I'm moving the mouse holding no buttons, you can see 0 is the value. When I start to hold the left mouse, it becomes 1. If I let go, it goes back to 0. If I hold the right mouse, that becomes 2. And you can see I now get that whole thing. Middle mouse becomes 4. Left and right is 3. Left, right, middle is 7. 5 for right and middle. 6 for left and middle. Uh, just pretty much any combination. So what I'm interested in is if we're holding down the left mouse button. So um, let's say we're only holding down the left mouse button. So e.buttons equals 1. Then console log e. Great, so not holding anything down, holding things down. Perfect, looks good. So what I want to do now is I want to uh, pretty much adjust the canvas by so that it follows the mouse. So if I were to click right here and I were to move the mouse over to here, I would want this same bulb that appears to go over to the le right. And I really hope you can see my mouse right now, because if you, if you can't, I just sounded like the biggest ass ever. Great. Um... So our i dis so I need to find the range between our minimum and maximum i range between our minimum and maximum r. So i range equals max i minus min i. R range equals max r minus min r. The movement delta 
I, I delta, why not? I delta. Oh yay, the new uh, Apple I delta. E dot movement X. I believe it's called movement X, is how you can see how much change was there. Yeah, so movement X is how far the mouse moved uh, since the last frame, or since that event was last fired, I suppose. Times I range var r delta e dot movement y canvas height times r range. Um, and so this right here is going to be a percentage of the screen across that it moved. And so times the range is going to be a percent across the imaginary and real ranges that were moved, or, or in actual values, I should say. So a percent times the total range is going to be an actual value transformed to those um, numbers. So now let's adjust our minimum i by i delta and our maximum i i delta. Our minimum r, r delta, maximum r r delta. And the reason I'm using plus for the r real values and minus for the imaginary values is because the mapping is done differently. In our OpenGL shader, our imaginary numbers are mapped from bottom to top, but in the canvas coordinates, it's mapped from top to bottom, so we just need to invert it. If we go in, you can see that I was wrong about something. Yep, I was wrong about something, and it looks really goofy. Okay, you know what, I think this is, I think this is another case of I messed up the width and height. Um, whoops, which these need to be changed then too. Yep, yep, that's what it was, is I just, I got things exactly backwards. Yeah, so, silly me, this is what I get for, uh, only kind of looking at my notes. All right. So cool. So now you can see if I were to click right here on this bulb and move it, it adjusts the bulb so that it follows my mouse. Pretty cool, eh? Great. And I think that is actually everything I wanted to show off in this video as well. So this concludes the series on how to make the WebGL viewer. Um, this code will be posted on my GitHub profile, um, so you can download the full complete source code if you'd like. And let's go through, and I'm just going to point out a couple of interesting things. So, as we set up in the first video, you can adjust the viewable size. I'm going to go into full screen mode for just a minute. Um, and so you can see when I put the window in full screen with F11, the entire viewable space is now taken up by our GL canvas. So this is the kind of thing that's ideal for if you want to make a video game. Um, hopefully I'm going to be covering a process in making a simple video game on my other channel pretty soon here. We'll see. So another thing I'm going to point out, this is one of the limitations of WebGL. So right now we have this really cool image and you see we're still getting a full 60 frames per second rendering this entire image even though we're doing 2,000 iterations on just this huge thing. Um, we're starting to get less frames per second partially because I'm recording right now. But as I zoom in, you can start to see noise and right about here this right here is a problem um this is a problem that is very difficult to avoid however the reason for that is webgl is pretty limited in that we only use 32-bit floats and the range for how small of numbers 32-bit floats can express is pretty tiny or uh it, it gets pretty small but it's not this small so the effect that we're seeing right here is because we've actually hit the bottom a floating point precision and we can't get any more precise. You can see that it's jumping pixel per pixel. Um, yeah, so that's going to be a problem that I don't think we can fix. And as we zoom out, you can see that was still really, really zoomed in. Um, you know, so we get an amazing amount of fidelity here. You can still look at some of the incredible details that are on this set. Um, but you can only get so small, and that's something that we won't be able to fix, which is unfortunate because these structures right here, I mean, look how cool that is, and it, it's starting to get a little bit grainy. There are some things that we're doing. Um, so to a point, one of the things you can do is you can adjust the iterations count. We're using high precision floats, but it's still going to be 32-bit. We can try to adjust the iteration count, so I'm going to double this and put it up at 4,000. I don't do any, I don't dare do any higher while I'm recording because I don't know what effect that would have. Um, 
And if we zoom in with that, we should see less noise, uh, but we're still going to have a similar effect. All right, hold on. Oh, goodness, this is really starting to lag. I am putting my computer to the limits here. I don't have a very great processor. I have a pretty good graphics card, but uh, not a good CPU. Yeah, so you can see, same effect kind of thing, um, which is unfortunate. But hey, this is still a really cool project, right? A lot cooler than uh, doing it in C++ just to, ge just to generate a single image. You're doing this at many, many frames per second. And this is the power of the graphics card. Any graphics applications, you will be able to leverage the power of shaders to do all sorts of incredible things like this. Um, you can input videos as textures using WebGL, so if you want to take a video and only output, like, put it through a grayscaling mask, you can do that just fine. You can take input from the webcam and do the same thing, render to a texture. Um, and so there's all sorts of really cool things you can do with fragment shaders. Um, and this, I just think, is a really simple example of one of the neat little hacks you can do. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed these last few videos. Um, like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know if there's anything you would like to see me do in WebGL or in any other kind of graphics technology. You know, I'm really interested in uh, doing OpenGL and C++ and Java, um, and then C Sharp. I do a lot of DirectX stuff, C++ as well, so just let me know. Thanks again for watching. Y'all have been great for making it this far. All right.